Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates, and here at No Limits, we want to help strengthen you, encourage you, and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin, and I want to thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. Today, I want to invite you to turn your attention to the 12th division of the Acts of the Apostles. If you have your Bibles, just turn there with me to Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. Look, I'm not going to read uh, the, entire, uh, the entire pericope. In your quiet moments, I want to encourage you to read those first 17 verses. It's a very familiar story about the way in which the Apostle Peter is delivered and set free after an imprisonment in a prison cell, and here's how he got his breakthrough. The Bible says that the church was praying fervently on his behalf. That's the kind of church I want to be connected with. I want to be connected to the kind of church that when I'm in trouble, when I'm in prison, they're not spreading gossip and rumors about me. They are in a posture of prayer. And so since we're talking about the year of power today, I want to talk about becoming a church of power through prayer. Amen. Do me a favor. Help me to uh, announce my theme and my subject to your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor, our power as a church is in our prayer. Come on, put your hands together. Give the Lord praise. Becoming a church of power through prayer. 56 years ago, February the 1st, 1965 to be exact, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led more than 250 activists to the Dallas County Courthouse to register to vote. Despite their peaceful protesting, their collective demonstration of democracy was abruptly halted and they were all arrested. Being arrested was nothing new for them. It often happened during the civil rights movement, as many of you know. Yet, what made this day and these arrests worthy of history was a photo that was taken immediately before the protest and subsequent arrest. It was a photo, as we are showing now, of Dr. King kneeling in prayer as others joined him in a posture of prayer. Years later, a historian interviewing one of the people there asked about the photo and whether or not that was a pivotal point in the movement for them. The person replied, the photo was the first time someone captured us praying, but it was not the first time we prayed. Prayer was a part of our normal routine, they said. It, it's what we did before, during, and after we marched. That subsequent, that sentiment regarding the centrality of prayer and its importance in the civil rights struggle is what was conveyed to me several years ago by the late Reverend Dr. Wyatt T. Walker. Dr. Walker was a leader in the movement and a former lieutenant alongside Dr. King. Dr. Walker told me once that the power of the movement came not just from the marches and the protests, but from the revivals and the prayer meetings they had before the rallies. His point was that the story of our freedom and liberation isn't fully told without understanding the importance of and uh, importance of the priority, the preeminence, and the power of prayer. What we often overlook is that the very thing that undergirded our struggle the very thing that propelled them in the face of vicious and racist opposition was not just a good plan and committed people, but accessing the presence and the power of God through prayer. Can the church say prayer? It was the prayers that they lifted in the church house that gave them the power to transform the world outside the church house. It was the prayers that they prayed on their knees that propelled them to protest when they got up on their feet. Let us never forget during this Black History Month that, that we are who we are and where we are, not just because of our connections, degrees, and contacts, but because of the centrality of prayer in the lives of our people. 
Our ancestors prayed to God, whether it was in Yoruba, Ibu, or Fulani during the Middle Passage, or in Geechee, Creole, or broken English on the slave plantation. Prayer kept us, encouraged us, strengthened us, and inspired us to be where we are today. Come on, have I got a witness listening? Somebody knows the song. Somebody prayed for me. They had me on their mind. They took the time and prayed for me. I am so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. Well, texts like the one we are considering today, Acts chapter 12, and passages like it are texts that inspired our people and leaders like Dr. King when confronting the trials of life and the injustices in the world. Here Luke tells us the story of what can happen when the whole congregation activates their God-given weapons to access heaven's power to give us breakthrough down here on earth. And if this is to be a year of power, it must be a year of prayer. Did y'all hear me, Mount Enon? If this is to be a year of power, it must be a year of prayer. Let us never forget that with poverty and racism on the rise, concern about COVID continuing to linger and uncertainty about things are going, when things are going to get better. Prayer is one thing. No, it is the only thing that's going to be to get us through these challenging times. The first four verses of Acts chapter 12 set the stage for the remainder of the story that follows here. Herod was the king during this time. And he had recently ordered that James the Apostle be put to death. In an effort to ratchet up the pressure on the followers of Jesus called the church, Herod had James' colleague and friend Peter arrested and placed in jail to await a similar, similar fate. It was within this context and against this backdrop that we discover how a small congregation of believers came together in a time of crisis to reach, rescue, and recover their fellow believer in a time of distress. They did the one thing that they knew how to do when circumstances exceeded their ability. They came together and they prayed. They couldn't call on the governor. They couldn't call on an attorney to work things out. And no one in the young church had connections down at City Hall. But the one connection they had was a connection to God, and they called on God in prayer. They show us that when you don't know who else to call, call on God. When you don't know who else to lean on, you got to lean on God. While this sermon is about the power of the church through prayer, it starts with Peter being a praying individual. At verse 5, the story shifts from Herod and our attention is directed toward the apostle Peter, a disciple of the Lord who just a few chapters earlier delivered the first sermon of the Christian church on the day of Pentecost. After his arrest, we are given information about his behavior while he is in prison on death row that I find quite interesting. In graphic detail, we are told in verse 6, that Peter is in prison sound asleep. That blew my mind because here is a man, here is a man whose dear friend and colleague and brother has just been killed. And now he himself is on death row knowing that his own execution is imminent. And yet, in the face of all of that stress, strain, and trauma, the Bible says that Peter is sound asleep. He's not popping pills. He's not drinking alcohol. The text says Peter is asleep. What an amazing resolve in a time of crisis. That, that blew my mind because most people who have less on the line than that uh, struggle to keep things together when their bills are high and marriage is on the rocks, when, uh, when family is driving you crazy. Many people need melatonin or Tylenol PM to put them to sleep, but not Peter. Peter, who is relatively young in the face at this time, approves to us that when God is with you and when God lives in you and when God uses you, that if God be for you, who 
can be against you. He shows us that even when the mountains we face are high and all hell is breaking loose around us, that you can go to sleep at night. I mean, why not? If it's true that the Lord neither slumbers nor sleeps, what good is it for both of you to be up at night? I, I don't care what's happening. God's people can still get some rest, even in restless times. Have I got a witness? Someone listening can testify that you have had storms and challenges all around you, but the good news is you were able to find peace in the middle of your storm. And uh, Peter must have been in deep sleep, y'all, because the Bible says he is bound with chains, the text says, uh, between two soldiers. He's got two men he's chained to, uh, and he's uh, in a cell with execution over his head. And yet, in the midst of all of that, the Bible says Peter is dead sleep. He's knocked out. Th that to me is an amazing assurance and resolve. Uh, God wants me to tell someone listening, get this, someone listening who has been worrying about where you are and what you are going through, that is time to go to bed. <laughs> come on, tell you, come on, type in the comment section, say, neighbor, it's time to go to sleep. <laughs> the question emerges then, how can a man under such circumstances go to bed? How can he rest when he's got a death sentence over his head and guards chained to his arm? How? Well, I believe it's because Peter was a person of prayer. Now, Peter has come a long way since we first met him. Yes, he has anger management issues. Yes, he cut off a guard's ear because he got upset. Yes, he denied Jesus three times. Yes, he lost faith while walking on water to Jesus. But this is a different Peter now. <laughs> He's heard, he heard Jesus teach about prayer. He saw Jesus actually bow down and pray. He saw Jesus pray in the garden of Gethsemane. And so I think that it's finally all kicked in. It's finally all coming together. You ever go, do you ever go to church all, uh, for a long time? You go to class after class, uh, and it seems never to kick in. But one day you find yourself going uh, through a trial, going through a storm and what mama and grandmama told you it finally start I think it is finally starting to kick in for Peter and you know what he understands he understands now that Jesus's public power started with private prayer. Uh, yeah, that's what Jesus modeled for us in Matthew 4. Jesus got victory over the devil in public because uh, he spent time alone with God in private. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, whenever you pray, I want you to go into your room and shut the door. You don't have to announce it. You don't have to post it on your Instagram stories. I want you to go into your room, shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your daddy who's in secret will reward you publicly. Down at here in Matthew chapter 14 verse 23 it says it says when he had sent the multitudes away that he went up into the mountain alone to pray. Can the church say prayer a second time? And so the power of prayer doesn't start corporately in the church. The power of prayer starts privately when you're by yourself. <laughs> See, if the first time you pray is when you gather with the saints, we'll never have corporate power. <laughs> uh, Jesus' public prayer started, public power started with private prayer. That's how he was able to cast out those demons. That's how he was able to heal the sick and feed the multitude raise the dead, and endure the cross with nails in his hands and feet and a crown of thorns on his head. He did all of that in public because he spent time with God in private. <clears throat> Is it possible, church, <clears throat> that we're not having the kind of public power that we need <laughs> 
because we're not spending time in private prayer with God? Is it possible that we're not having the victory and the manifestations that we desire to have in public because we're not spending the kind of time with God in private prayer? If you want public power, you're going to need to spend time in private prayer. And if we're to be a church of prayer, of prayer, we need more individuals of prayer. Peter shows us that a praying church must be filled with praying believers. I, I believe Peter was asleep while on death row also, not just because he prayed, but because he realized he had given ownership of his problem over. He had given up ownership of, of his problem. Are y'all listening? See, a lot of time, we take ownership of our problem. Yeah. But Peter understood that deliverance requires us to relinquish ownership of the problem. And that can only happen by reminding God that the battle is not ours. It's the Lord's. <laughs> Somebody say it's the Lord's. <laughs> yeah, Peter was chilling between those guards because the situation was not his. Peter understood that while he was going through the trial, that, the, that God ultimately was going to get the glory. <laughs> he wasn't praying for deliverance so he could protect his reputation or pursue a career aspiration. He understood that God's name was on the line. And when God's name is on the line, then you don't have anything to worry about. Sort of like in Exodus chapter 9, verse 14, the Bible says that the Lord told Moses to tell Pharaoh that he was going to send plagues throughout Egypt so that Pharaoh would know that there is no God like him in all the earth. Y'all missed your shout. The point of the prayer was so uh, that God would get glory. See, God, church, is not interested in us having bragging rights about how much faith we have uh, or about how successful we are. God is not interested uh, about other people saying how good of a prayer we are. But God is interested uh, if his name is on the line. Have I got a witness here? It's sort of like someone, it's sort of like someone coming to you and saying, hey, uh, can you give me a thousand dollars? And you say, why you want a thousand dollars? And they say, I want you to give me a thousand dollars so I can go on vacation. <laughs> well, if the if the request is about them, you're more inclined to look at them like they're crazy. But if they come into you and say, hey, can you give me $1,000 for this project? And if you give me $1,000, I'm going to put your name on the wall. Uh, and if they make the issue about you and not them, you're more likely to give them your attention. Perhaps, church, we should stop going to God with prayers that are always about us. I am sick and tired of prayers that are just about us. Our car, our man, our woman, our marriage, our situation. Uh, try praying that God uh, might get some glory out of your situation. I, I want to tell you that if you get down uh, on your knees uh, and you make it about God getting the glory, heaven will start shifting. Uh, have I got a witness here? When you look at the text, I want to tell you that when Peter is in prison uh, between those two guards uh, giving up ownership over his situation, uh, uh, the Bible says God begins to show up. Have I got a witness here? This praying individual was connected to a praying church. And when he was in jail, the Bible says in verse 5 that the church prayed for him. Have I got a witness now? Now, that's a beautiful picture if I ever saw one. Here is the pastor, the leader and under shepherd of the local church. Church, He's in trouble, and the church decides to pray for him. They don't talk about him. Uh, they don't scandalize his name. They don't send out a group email. Uh, the bot, you know, you know, Peter, the pastor, he's in jail. Uh, I can't believe the pastor's in. No, the Bible says that the saints of God 
are joined to, I feel my help coming, they got together in prayer. One of the members gave the church permission to hold a prayer service at her house. I don't know whether a pandemic was going on at the building, but the Bible says they came together at Mary's house uh, not to complain, not to spread gossip, not to eat chicken, uh, not to socialize, not to plot on how to remove the pastor, but they came together to have prayer. And that's how we should respond in a, pri a crisis church. We ought to call one another and join together and pray. Rather than using church this pandemic as an excuse to avoid spiritual devotion, we should instead use it as a time to get closer to God. Now that we don't have to get ready an hour before church to get to church, now that we don't have to drive 30 minutes to get to church and uh, spend time uh, trying to find a spot to park. We should use this extra time on Sundays uh, not to go to brunch. Uh, Y'all got upset. But we should use this extra time to pray. Oh, I've been talking to people. They've been telling me they love worshiping online. And I asked them, why you like worshiping online? And I'm waiting for some deep spiritual answer. I'm waiting for them that I I can spend more time in the word. I can spend more time in the face of God. But they tell me I like it because I can spend more time washing my car and washing my clothes and going to brunch with my girlfriends. And I ain't tripping on all of that. But, but God says that the pandemic is not a time for you to slack off. The pandemic is a time for you to draw closer to God in prayer, for you to draw closer to God in worship, for you to draw closer to God in the word of God. Have I got a witness here? Why not use those extra 15 minutes to get down on your knees and say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, whither shall I go? Have I got a witness? The Bible says men ought to always pray and faint not. Whether it's in a pandemic, we should pray. Whether you're being foreclosed on, you should pray. Whether we're in the building or out of the building, we ought to pray. Prayer is the one thing that we ought to do when you can't do nothing else. These folks, church, they were serious about prayer. I want you to notice the Greek adverb in verse 5, ektonos. Ektonos translated means fervently. Can somebody say fervently? Uh, the Greek word ektonos is a medical term describing the stretching of a muscle to its limits. Oh, oh, Lord, have mercy. So when they prayed fervently, uh, they were stretching their spiritual muscles. Uh, to, they understood that when prison time comes, uh, that is not the time to slack off, church. That's the time to get in the face of God. Oh, we need more believers who are praying fervently to God. Have I got a witness? They weren't playing around. They were serious about praying. And I'm convinced, church, that we ought to pray with so much fervor and so much zeal and so much passion and so much intensity and so much dedication until things start shifting. Have I got a witness? See, look what happened when they prayed. Several things happen when they pray. I want to tell you when the church prays, you got to get ready for some results. Tell your neighbor, get ready for the results. In verse 7, it says that when they prayed, an angel appears and the light starts to shine. <laughs> which suggests that when we pray, God is going to dispatch some angels who are uniquely assigned to your predicament. And when you start praying, you're going to see your situation better than you saw it before. Have I got a witness? Somebody can testify that when you prayed, you saw your finances, you saw your marriage, you saw your health situation better. 
than you saw it before. Have I got a witness? Somebody else can testify that when I prayed, God sent an angel who was assigned to my problem. Not only did an angel come and the light shine, the Bible says that Peter gets a touch and his chains fall off. Oh, I wish I had more time. But can I tell you something? When you pray, the chains that have kept you in bondage, they're going to fall off, honey. Uh, chains of depression. Chains of poverty. Chains of disease. Have I got a witness? When you pray, the chains are going to fall off. In the spirit realm, I feel some shackles falling. Oh, but somebody else, you better get ready for a touch. God is getting ready to touch your life. God is getting ready to touch your situation. God is getting ready to touch your body, to touch your mind, to touch your son, to touch your daughter. Have I got a witness? Come on, somebody ought to shout and thank God because a touch is on the way. Have I got a witness? Not only did an angel show up, and not only did the light shine, not only did uh, the chains fall off, and not only did he get a touch, but verse 8 says that the angel tells Peter, I want you to get dressed. I want you to put on your boots, put on your sandals, put on your pants, and put on your shirt. Cause I, I, I imagine Peter said, why you want me to get dressed? The angel said, because we going to walk out of this prison cell. Don't miss the shout. The Bible says that the angel tells Peter, get dressed, Peter. You about to walk out of the very thing that's been holding you down. And God sent me to tell somebody that it's time for you to get dressed. It's time to put on your walking shoes. It's time for you to put on your clothes. Have I got a witness? Come on, type in the comment section. Say, neighbor, it's time to go. Oh, that's the wrong neighbor. Tell your other neighbor. Say, neighbor, it's time to go. You've been in this cell for too long. You've been in this problem for too long. You've been in this prison for too long. It's time to go. And can I tell you something? You know when it's time to go because you start walking past the very ones who've been holding you down and holding you in. I'm in the text. Look at verse 10. It says Peter gets up and he starts walking past all of the guards and all of the soldiers who've been holding him down and holding him in. Oh, look, I need y'all to get the image. He puts on his sandals, pulls up his pants, puts on his cloak, and he starts walking past all of his haters, all of his prognosticators. That's power, church. When Peter prayed, an angel appeared. When Peter prayed, a light was shined. When Peter prayed, a touch was received. When Peter prayed, chains fell off. When Peter prayed, an exit was made. And that suggests that James 5, 16 is right. That the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. I like the New Living Translation. It says the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power to produce results. Have I got a witness? Well, I stop by to tell somebody that when we pray, 
it's going to produce results. An angel, light, a touch, chains, going to fall off. Have I got a witness? Somebody ought to shout in your living room. Somebody ought to shout in your kitchen. Because an angel is showing up. Light is about to shine. A touch is about to be received. And change, change, change are about to come out. Have I got a witness? Somebody ought to bless God. But can I tell you something? Oh, I feel my help. There's more in the text. The Bible says Peter is stunned. He thinks he's seen a vision. And upon arriving at the prison gate, the Bible says that the gate fly open. And I want to tell somebody that the gates that have been confining you are about to fly open. Get this. Gates of self-doubt. Gates of fear. Gates of low self-esteem. Gates of poverty. Gates of negative. They are about to fly open. I don't care about your past. Your future is greater than your past. Have I got a witness? Peter is astonished, but he realizes that he's got more work to do. So the Bible says that he makes his way to where the church is. He goes to Mary's house. And Luke does not tell us if Peter knew that the church was praying. But when he got there, verse 13 says that he starts knocking on the door. He's knocking on the door. And the Bible says that as Peter is knocking on the door, Rhoda answers and she loses it and slams the door in Peter's face. And you got to get this. The church is praying for Peter. And their answer is already at the door. Y'all missed a shot. Uh, uh, she starts running and screaming and screaming that Peter is at the door. They say, girl, you out of your mind. They did not believe what she said. But the good news is that while they were praying, what they were praying for was already at the door. Oh, y'all missed a shout. I want to tell somebody that the financial problem you've been praying for is already at the door. The relationship question you've been praying about is already at the door. The issue on your job that you've been praying about is already at the door. Somebody ought to thank God that my answer my healing, my deliverance, my breakthrough, my miracle, my promotion, my supply, my healing. It's at the door, honey. So when they ask you where you going, tell them I'm going to the door. Because God got a miracle at the door. Have I got a witness? Oh, I see. I know this is a smart class. I know you're saying to yourself, but the church didn't believe that Peter was at the door. So you're saying, you're saying, like many commentators, you're saying the church must not have been praying in faith because when Peter showed up, they didn't believe it was him. I know that's what you're saying. You're saying there's a problem in the text because if they were praying in faith, they would have believed that it was Peter. But I don't believe they weren't praying in faith. I believe, I think they prayed in faith. The issue in the text is that when God moved, God exceeded their expectation. 
Yo, Mr. Shout, uh, I believe, uh, I believe that they were praying in faith, uh, but they were just praying for Peter to be comforted uh, while he was in prison, uh, awaiting execution. Uh, I believe they prayed in faith, uh, but perhaps they prayed uh, that rather than killing Peter, uh, that Herod would spare his life uh, and give him a life sentence in jail or hard prison labor. They never imagined that Peter would get out, but that was not a part. That was not because they weren't praying in faith. They prayed in faith, but God had a way of showing up and showing out in ways that exceeded their expectation. You do know that's what God will do, don't you? He'll do exceeding, abundantly, above all you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Have I got a witness? So while she was trying to explain what was happening, Peter kept knocking at the door. Peter had to motion to the church, y'all quiet down, because I got to tell you everything that God has done. Have I got a witness? God heard their prayer. God heard their fervent cry, and he came to see about them, and that's what God does when the church prays. He did it in Exodus. He came to Moses and said, I have seen the affliction of my people. I've heard their cry. I'm going to get out of your way. But I stopped by to tell somebody that if we're going to be a church of power through prayer, that God is going to shift something. God is going to change something. I mean, just think about what just happened in this last election. God saw our affliction over the last four years and God heard our cry. I don't think it happened just because of good campaigning. I believe we got a new president, a new vice president, and a Congress that's not divided because the people had a mind to pray. Have I got a witness? And if we want God to do it again, we got to get down on our knees and pray. Have I got a witness? The old saints were right. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. In prayer, God will do what you cannot do by yourself. In prayer, God will shift what you can't shift by yourself. In prayer, God will move what you can't move by yourself. Have I got a witness? Is there anybody here who can thank God for the power of prayer? Have I got a witness? You can check the record on what prayer can do. Moses prayed and God spared Israel judgment. Joshua prayed and God called the sun to stand still. Hannah prayed and God gave her a baby. Solomon prayed and God gave him wisdom. Elijah prayed and God sent down fire. Jonah prayed and God brought him out the well. The thief prayed on the cross and God gave him eternal life. I tell you, the saints were right that prayer will tap into heaven and bring down power on earth. All you got to do is pray about it. Have I got a witness? Come on, put your hands together and give God some 
praise today. There's power in prayer. Power in prayer. Peter prayed. And the Bible said an angel showed up. <laughs> Light began to shine. He got a supernatural touch. And the chains fell off. Oh, I want to tell you, Mount Eden, when we begin to pray, the power is going to come on. Come on, put your hands together. Bless the Lord today. Listen, praise the Lord. Our power is in our prayer. And it can't begin in public. It's got to start in private. God gives us public victory. When we first spend time alone in prayer, I want to challenge someone listening right now. Make a commitment to pray daily. Pray in the morning. Pray at night. Pray at noon. Pray without ceasing. <clears throat> prayer is just a conversation with God. He already knows about your predicament. <clears throat> he already knows about your problem. Ask him to give you illumination, to give you revelation to give you guidance, strength, and power, and clarity. <clears throat> and then do like Peter does. Give up ownership of the problem. He is in prison, facing execution, between guards, fast asleep. I want to have that kind of prayer life, where in the middle of my prison, I can be fast asleep. God says it's time to go to bed. It's time to go to bed. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org and look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. I created No Limits to help you strengthen your daily walk with God. And there is no better way to start your day than with the No Limits Daily Devotion email. Each devotion contains a passage from scripture and some insight to inspire you to feel God's love and to live a life with no limits. You can sign up today to start receiving the daily email by going to delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. Thank you in advance for signing up for the daily devotion email and I pray that it helps you to live each day with no limits. Hello, I want to thank you for watching the broadcast today and I have an exciting announcement for you. The No Limits free mobile app is now available for both Apple and Android devices. I want to invite you to download the app right now. Simply go to the App Store on your phone and search for No Limits with Pastor Delman to find and download the free app. Or you can go to a special page on our ministry website to find the direct link to download the app. The page is found at delmancoats.org forward slash mobile. And with the No Limits app, you can watch my messages, read daily devotionals, access the entire Bible, and much, much more. And before I go, let me ask you for a favor. 
If you like what you see on the app, please tell your family and friends about it as we want to connect with more people to help them live a life with no limits. Thank you again for watching the message today and know that I'm praying for you to be strengthened in your walk with the Lord and I ask that you please pray for me each time that you watch. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of No Limits and Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland.